Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Oh, don't look now, but it's Friday, you guys, right here on Run It Back. We are, I'm sporting my sweet-ass merch. Chandler looks like a character out of a movie. And then there's Shams, who will always be the professional one amongst us. And we've accepted that, Shams. We appreciate you. <laughs> no, I appreciate you guys. Uh, Chandler, Chandler, is that baby blue you got on today? Yeah, hey, you know what? Haley said it makes my eyes pop, so I threw it on. Figured why not. <laughs> That's that. You know what? Doesn't She's officially a stylist. Pop, it it's brings also, out the bloodshot. Uh, you guys, you got Michelle. You left. It's obviously been cold all week. It is freezing in LA. Really? In this weather. It was. I got sunburned two days ago. And now it's damn near snowing. It is ridiculous. Well, I did leave in time. I was wondering why that's. We were delayed like hours last night. I wonder if that's why. You know what? Let's just talk for an hour about our our travel plans. Oh no! We, I'm sorry. I'm being told we have to move on. Scoops. So global warming. <laughs> Let's dive into that. <laughs> global warming. What is it? Uh, Sham Scoops are here. Yeah, Miami with uh, with getting a player back, which could not be more perfect timing. Shams, what's going on there? Tyler Hero has been out since February 23rd with a foot injury. He's he's underwent PRP. He's had an extensive rehab process. I'm told he is close to returning. He could be back in the lineup as soon as tonight against the <laughs> Rockets in Houston. There is optimism. Uh, he could suit up tonight and play uh, the Heat are on a three-game road trip tonight in Houston, in Indy on Sunday, and then Atlanta next week. And the hope is that he will definitely play in one of these three games, possibly tonight. We know what he's Ooh. capable of when he's on the floor. 21 points a night, four assists a game. He's only played 36 games, though. And last year, he, he fractured his hand in the playoffs, uh, ends up missing the entire postseason and so getting him back in the lineup now with a handful of games left before the, before the start of the playoffs, the playing tournament, uh, they want to make sure he's back in the lineup and is able to get a rhythm. Because if he's healthy, if he's ready, th this is a massive boost to this rotation, to this lineup. And uh, there is optimism he could play tonight. This is insane. Uh, and by the way, they're facing a Houston team that's like licking their wounds from last night, Shams, which will make it even more hilarious. But they're a half game back of the Pacers. And I bring Chandler back in because we we, to we talk about it all season long. Don't count them out. Don't count them out. Sometimes it almost feels like we're just saying the words. But my God, they're right there, Chandler. They're about to do this again, aren't they? Yeah. And they're not just getting, uh, you know, an average player. They're getting... Arguably their best scorer when, when healthy. So Tyler Hero is a proven bucket. The guy puts up 20 plus a game. He's usually rather efficient and he does a little bit of everything. He can handle the ball and pick and roll. He can go get you a bucket and transition. End of clock, he can create his own shot. So the addition of Terry Rozier was kind of to, to help that with him out. But now you have both of these guys at will can go and score and play iso ball, but also can play within the flow of the offense. They can stretch the defense and shoot. It's the perfect storm for the Miami Heat, and this is what they do. They somehow kind of just cruise through the regular season, let the chips fall as they may, and now here we are in April, and we're looking at the standings, and they are probably going to get the sixth seed and play the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Cavaliers in the first round. <laughs> and it's hard not to take the heat in that series. So this, this has been a crazy up and down, inconsistent season for the Heat, but the most important time of the season is right now going into the postseason and when can what team get everybody healthy and that seems to be the trend right now for the miami heat and and when they're healthy they are loaded they are deep they have offense they have defense they have experience they have size they have it all so it's tough for these teams that had a great season all year long you know like oh. like these three seeds Celtics. in both conferences, it's not going to be a, a, a sweep in the first round like we're sometimes used to seeing. So this is interesting, and this is what the Heat do, and it looks like they're going to do it again. I mean, now that I'm back in New York where I can use my old little app, that plus 1,600 to win the East, <laughs> why not? If you're Boston right now, by the way, are you just thinking, oh, surely not, you can't do it again? Are they scared a little bit? <laughs> Well, they shouldn't be scared. The Celtics they are the best team. The Celtics are, listen, they should respect them. They should know the history of what they can do. They know that for whatever okay. reason, it's not like a myth. They turn it on in the playoffs. And Jimmy Butler takes it up a notch in the playoffs. And the Heat do match up personnel-wise really, really well with the Boston Celtics. And they're a much deeper team. So 
It would it would be an interesting, you know, Eastern Conference finals, just crazy with the playoffs haven't even started yet. We only know what seed the Heat are getting, and we talk about them possibly going to the finals now, just getting healthy. Um, but those odds, plus 1,600, they're not bad. I think the honesty should be higher just because I think it's far stretched that they could beat the Celtics in a series. But again, injuries happen, and, and maybe they happen to someone else, and so not the Heat, and they hit their right. momentum at the right time. So... Who knows, but this this is a team that I think is just going to continue to get better and better and better, and other teams are kind of going to dwindle away. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. I'm excited for it. Uh, Shams, you also had some amazing, and I do mean amazing, underlying Hall of Fame news yesterday. Share it. Sources tell me Vince Carter, Chauncey Billups have been elected to the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, class Yay! of 2024. Official announcement, not until tomorrow on Saturday at the Final Four in Phoenix. But that is what I have. Obviously, Vince Carter, eight-time All-Star, two All-NBA teams, number 21 on the all-time scoring list, a league record, 22 seasons. We know he's a gold medalist as well. Chauncey Billups, uh, NBA champion in 2004, finals MVP. He was also a a three-time All-NBA player, five-time All-Star, 17 NBA seasons. Well-deserved for both of them. Another name also uh, that will be enshrined into the Hall of Fame, Michael Cooper, five-time champion with the Lakers, Defensive Player of the Year, five-time All-Defensive Player as well. So uh, those are three pretty notable names that will enter the Hall of Fame, headlined by Vince Carter and Sean Sebelius. Shout out Vince Carter, also a friend of the program. Friend of the show. And also, if it's not official, I've already congratulated both of them and they accepted. So (laughs) I think it's pretty official now. There you go, Michelle. Uh, Michelle (laughs) Michelle with a confirmation. (laughs) Sorry. Vince, Vince Carter, too. I mean, I love Chauncey Billups. I love Coop, but Vince Carter, this dude, growing up in Orlando, I was the biggest Vince Carter fan, and he went to Daytona Beach Mainland High School. My family, we would drive to his games just to see him play and sell out gyms. So the fact that, you know, God, that was so long ago, the fact that he now, especially from my hometown in Orlando, he's an NBA Hall of Famer. It's much deserved. I caught him at the last year of my season of my career in Atlanta. The greatest dude ever, right? Was, wasn't playing much, was 40 years old and still so committed, still the hardest working dude there, first one there, last to leave. So even throughout the, his whole career, when he was literally on the way out, he was still a professional. He was still a great leader, a great role model for the rookies. Um, so I got nothing but love for Vince. That's huge, and it's it's well, well-deserved. Uh, Cha- and Chance, I, I mean, I worked with both of them on the TV side and Chance, obviously, for a little bit longer on NBA Countdown. And I could not be happier um, to see both of them. And I can't wait to hear the speeches. I'm wondering, do you think either one of them does like a a serious sort of tear inducing speech? Are we thinking I'm thinking, are they going to get help? Will there be jokes? What are we thinking here? Uh, uh, Chance, I mean, I've seen think- both. I think they'll both put a little a little touch of humor on it, but I think I, it's, it's hard it's hard not to get emotional. Like this is crazy. This is what you you dream of, right? You dream of making the NBA. Then you just want to fit in. Then you want to be really good. But now to be considered one of the best of all time, it, it's probably extremely extremely hard not to get emotional. And these guys are, are are so talented and so so good at what they did that this is all kind of a celebration and a combination of everything they've done so i think they get i think vince definitely cries Ooh, we should put money on See, this i i 100 agree i mean michelle you probably know them better you've worked with them extensively i've seen some of these interviews that vince carter has done it seems like he t- he's taking this very emotionally every step of the way when he got the call um and then obviously he was on with us in, i believe february talking about it chauncey billups to me uh, current portland trailblazers coach let's shout out that he seems a little bit more calm, cool, collected at all times. Um, but listen, it'll be an emotional moment. To me, though, I, I definitely think Vince will shed it. Okay. All right. We got five on Vince for sure. Let me think about Chauncey. I'm going to put some thought into that and get a vision. <laughs> it's going to be fun to watch. Um, we did he have might some just games surprise last us night. all and just have a it, tear right? fest. Right? Or they don't. It's passionate. just a chuckle know fest. It. This man is passionate when he plays golf and when he misses a putt. He, <laughs> a he's he's, yeah, he's going to be passionate making that Hall of Fame speech. Okay, then I'll put 20 on it. Okay, you, you convinced me. Um, Warriors-Rockets, that was the game last night that uh, people had their eye on. Why? Well, because the Rockets talked smack. Well, Tari Eason talked smack. Warriors come out to play. 
And the Warriors did come out and they played and it was an ass whooping. Uh, 133, 110. They now have a four game lead on Houston. So it's pretty much done there. But Curry with 29, six and six. Clay Thompson. I love when Clay Thompson just is like, you got to fuel him and he shows up. Finished with 29, three and four. Jalen Green, 13, seven and four. Uh, Warriors. I think it was the knockout punch. Draymond Green even said, you know, we have an opportunity tonight to end their season. Uh, and the Warriors themselves have been on a tear as of late. Do we start buying stock? Where, where realistically should we start putting this Warriors team as we approach these playoffs? Uh, I mean, realistically, they are where they are. And I don't think, I think it's going to be a dogfight for them just to get out of the play-in. So when you look at this play-in, all three of those teams, the Kings, the Suns, and the Lakers, they're probably better teams. Now, are they more dangerous? Are they going to beat them in this play-in tournament? Who knows? Oh, now it's shifted with the Pelicans. Um, it's going to be tough. It, it's going to be really tough because that Lakers-Warriors game first is going to be is going to be a huge one, obviously, because they might not even get a chance to, to make it if they if they lose that game. So I'm looking at the big picture of this. The Western Conference, man, it's just so deep. It's so stacked. We always say don't count out Steph Curry, don't you know, don't count out the Warriors. And now Clay Thompson goes and has games like this last night where he shows he still has a lot left in the tank. But it's tough. It's tough. I'm I'm not I'm not that plus 3400, it looks cool, but the, I, I wouldn't touch that just because the West is so good. And I just they're gonna have their own problems getting out of the play in tournament, let alone surviving once they're in. But what's crazy, I'll tell you this, they'll almost have an easier a harder time getting out of getting in like making the play in and, and surviving and getting that seven or eight seed well they won't get the seven seed than winning their first round series like i think they have a better chance of surprising and knocking off okc in the first round or knocking off minnesota in the first round that could happen more likely than them you know huh. in the play in tournament it's that it's that deep uh, all of that being said, though, they are still missing a pretty key piece uh, of the equation here, Shams. Do you have any news on Kaminga? Yeah, John and the Kaminga worked out on Tuesday. There was thought, Steve Kerr even said it the other day, that they expect him to play on Thursday. He does not play. He worked out yesterday. Um, I'm told this is a day-to-day -day injury. He's missed five games now. They're on a six-game winning streak. They, that's essentially giving them reason to be cautious with Kaminga. He worked out again last night before the game. Uh, the thought is this is a day-to-day -day injury. This is nothing that's going to keep him out much longer. Um, but they want to make sure he's going to he's going to be back as close to 100% as possible, especially now that they're on this winning streak. And what's crazy is about their record. They would be, I mean, fighting for potentially home court advantage in the Eastern Conference if, if they were in the Eastern Conference. So the West is a bloodbath, uh, especially teams 7 to 10. I mean, Lakers, Warriors, Kings, one of those teams is going to be very, very disappointed by the end of uh, by the end of the playing tournament one of them is obviously going to get bounced and we'll see who it's going to be in new orleans right now also sliding down with brandon ingram sideline so the, the west of the bloodbath the warriors are on a on a winning streak right now and i think that's giving them reason to be cautious we'll see if coming up plays tonight i would not be surprised if he sits and then they try to play him potentially this weekend or a little bit after Chom, the, the craziest thing the, the best thing for them is that the pelicans slides i think they have a better chance of beating the pelicans in the play-in than beating the phoenix suns so that is great news for golden state that the phoenix suns aren't going to be in their way at all possibly and that that could be the new orleans <laughs> pelicans but it's crazy they're 42 and 34 it's not a bad year they're eight games over 500 God. and they're and they're the 10th seed like like jesus it's, it's crazy that 10th seed last place play-in team is eight games over 500 just shows you how stacked the western conference is I know what a great problem to have that that's what we're talking about. Like how the fact that it feels like, I mean, maybe Denver really does have the advantage, but it feels like anyone can make a difference here. Speaking specifically on this Warriors team, Chandler, talk a little bit about the importance of some of their young guys who've stepped up and, and Kaminga, of course, being one of them, Jackson Davis being one, Pajemski being one, which by the way, have you seen that person courtside that wears a Pajemski shirt? It's like a button down with a thousand of his face on it. I don't know who that is, but Shout out. That's all I wanted to say. No, I haven't, but it's, it's been, it's been probably the biggest bright spot of their season, just because as much struggles as they've had, as much as the talk about this dynasty over 
at least they know they have these three solid pieces also moving forward. And to me, it's Trace Jackson Davis. That guy, I mean, he had a great career in Indiana. He was an All-American in Indiana. One of the last picks in the draft. And this guy is one of their most valuable prospects moving forward. He can do it all. He can defend. He's so bouncy. It's kind of that undersized five that can play a little four. Um, and he's extremely productive on the offensive end without taking a jump shot. So I, I think him, the development of Kaminga is obviously great because he's the one of those three guys with real star power and potential all-star career type player. And then Pazinski's shown that he's a starting guard in this league and he can hopefully do this for years to come. So the fact that we are talking about this dynasty ending and is Clay going to be there? What do they do with Draymond? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is all a huge issue because we've seen greatness from this team for so long. And Steph Curry has been unbelievable all year long again, which is no surprise. That's what we expect from him now. But when you have guys like Chris Paul and Clay Thompson, the Germany, there's always all these questions. There's no questions with those three. And you can even throw in Moody there because those guys are going to be the part of their future. And if not, they're at least going to get good assets back for them because they have that much value. So they're not like they're fully retanking if they get rid of Draymond or Clay gets moved or signed somewhere else this summer. You know what I mean? They still have enough there to compete. So it's not a full rebuild. Um, but it, it, it's extremely important that during this stretch of kind of the end of this dynasty, they have still groomed these three young kids to be potential studs, you know, with that organization. Yeah, the, the, the Warriors had a moment, I think, with Jordan Poole where you felt like, okay, this is a young guy that you can put in that situation. He's young, up and coming. He's a guy that we can build our franchise around. Obviously, that takes a downward spiral. <laughs> there was clearly a clash between Jordan Poole and the veteran players, most notably uh, Draymond Green. But with the, with these guys, I think it's it's a little bit different. John the is a guy that's been, been welcoming the veteran presence and someone that Draymond Green's taken under his wing. Pazemski has also fit right in, trying to be a utility player. Trish Jackson Davis comes with no baggage, no issues, just straight up production, straight up hard work, uh, great teammate. Like You hear nothing but positive things about him. And that's a position of need for them at center. They needed a big man to kind of take over for Kevon Looney's minutes and be a presence for them. So to me, it's, kind of, it's definitely a changing of the guard. We've been talking about it here on this show since the beginning of the season, like the clash of, of young and and this veteran side of this team. But it's, as the year's gone on, it's been bumpy, but you've seen it kind of become seamless. And, you know, you look at this team's record right now. Uh, I think they're 11 and 14 without Draymond Green, 31 mm -hmm. and 20 with him. That lets you know that this is a much better basketball team with Draymond Green. This is a team that, even if they lose in the plane, could they convince themselves that next year, healthy, with a fully integrated Draymond Green for the entire season, could this be a team that contends again? I think they, they have somewhat of a case. I, like, I'm not going to count them out another year. If you bring Klay Thompson back, the, the question and the key is having health and making sure you keep a guy like Jim Green on the floor. Yeah, the Klay Thompson of it all is, is such a intriguing piece That's of the That's the big speak. question. The question isn't, it is Draymond Green going to be back? It's, will Klay Thompson be back? I can't. I'm not going to picture it. All right. Speaking on Draymond Green, by the way, on his podcast, he was referencing the uh, the Tari Eason trash talk um, that he did with the Warriors video. And then he follows up by wearing, by the way, still on the bench. He's he's hurt. Wearing a shirt last night. Warriors come out and play. Um, bro. But then they got their asses handed to them. So Chandler, while I love a good smack talk and I love this yeah. kid referencing a move. And this movie is like, 40 years before he was even born. Um, but what do we think about this? Yeah, you're talking to a guy that's extremely petty myself. And I love I love this whole situation. <laughs> this was this went just about as bad as it could go for Taris. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> first of all, they come out and play. Like, I get it. Your team got hot. Your team got extremely hot. Jalen Green was unbelievable. It's it's a fun message. It's just the it's the wrong messenger. Like you've played 22 games, mm -hmm. you're averaging nine points a game. You're 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 barking up the wrong tree, kid. And it, it's just it's just not smart. And it, it and you look like a fool. And it, they the game wasn't even close last night. They sweeped you guys, I think, 3-0 this year. So they kind of owned you guys. They've dominated you all season long. And this is just the one team like talk, talk shit to the, you know, Minnesota's the OKC's the teams that are on the rise. You show respect to the golden state warriors. You don't, you don't poke a bear and that's what they did. And, and, and Draymond, 
say what you want about him. I guarantee you he got this team fired up. You could tell by his tone he was this was personal uh, the way he wanted this. They don't like the, the Rockets. Clay Thompson, they don't he doesn't like Dylan Brooks. Now, is this Tar Eason <laughs> behavior too? Is this something stemming from this Dylan Brooks situation now? Because now this team is turning into this this Grizzlies of last year where they're kind of the, the villains and they talk trash and they're gonna start playing dirty. Who knows? But I like Tar Eason's game. I think he's got a really, really good future. I I I I really do, but this is just this is ignorant and this is this is the last team that I would do this to, given the circumstances too. And he got what he deserved. They got their ass whooped and, and he got embarrassed. And he was sitting there with that final scoreboard. With that shirt. With, with that shirt on. I would think about maybe keeping a hoodie or something under the under the chair to throw on a over. Card, like a cardigan or a warm-up. Yeah. <laughs> This this didn't really age very good, and their season is one thousand percent over. And the Warriors had a lot to do with that. With them three dubs they got against them. In defense, uh, Timberwolves no come out and play. No further questions. You're on. No, you you're not done. Uh, because you mentioned Clay Thompson doesn't like. I mean, first of all, what's wrong with Dylan Brooks? Now I, I get it, but he uh, he had some thoughts as well after this one. Here he is. Seem like you guys heard the uh, that uh, Warriors come out to play. Video. Yeah, that's pretty lame, especially if you're not even playing. Like it's one thing if you're playing, and you're out there competing, and you can back it up. But if you're just gonna be trolling from the sideline, like bro, what are we doing? Like the times we talk mess. At least we're out there competing. I'm not gonna. Miss. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so, I just I love Clay Thompson. Yeah, he's right. I mean, it's it, it's a little. You know what though. If a teammate would have told him not to wear that shirt, I'm sure it would have been fine. He would have taken it off. So clearly they thought it was funny, right? Yeah, that's that's my thing. Like like Fred Van Vliet, like you can't like pull him aside, be like, hey man, like <laughs> <laughs> bad look, like you probably don't want to do this. And again, like when I was hurt and I was out in Memphis, I, I didn't have really any right or any business to like to stand on and talk shit because I wasn't contributing. I wasn't playing. And yeah, I'd still be petty and I'd still throw jabs on Twitter and things like that or talk shit to a fan in the crowd. But to literally spark this whole thing yourself while you're not playing, and I understand you're maybe he's trying to rally up the troops. Maybe he's trying to get his guys going. But I'm thinking like you, Michelle, if I'm a vet on that team, if I'm Fred, if if I'm, you know, Reggie Bullock, if I'm Jock Land, I'm I'm hey man. Bad, bad idea. Like we're fighting to get into the play and we've had a pretty shit season. Like this could, let's not make this any more worse than it already is. And he did. Even Steph had the, uh, the old plastic water bottles in reference to the glass bottle moment. Cause that is the dude who says it, you know? So it's just, it's awesome. They were all in on it. Um, the fact that they're veterans and they still didn't let it bother them, but it got to them enough that they responded Love everything about it. Um, Steph, Ime Steph Odoka. Is, Steph was low-key, creatively, yes. uh, in a funny way, very petty. I think he's shown that over his career. I love it. Especially as he's, as he's getting his later years. I oh, think I he, love he, it. you got to love it. It's creative. I mean, look, they are fighting for their lives as well. And then you got these young pups over here talking. And it's specifically one. But Dylan Brooks is still on the team, too. So it's, it's kind of an overall vibe, right? But they're talking smack. How do you not respond? And they did, both on the scoreboard and in their actions. Um, Ime Odoka, after this one, had something to say about his team's effort. Just from the start, it seemed something was off. Did you get a feel for that's why it was so hard to get kind of footing and into the game the normal way, the usual way? Yeah, it, it looked like the moment was too big for a lot of players out there. Mm. Saw it look like deer in headlights a little bit. Uh, either look soft or scared, mm. one or the other. And that's two poor, two bad things for a lot of our guys to have and uh, didn't rise up to the moment like I thought we would. Just from the start. <laughs> um, so, OK. Uh, so what? to top it off, you talk shit, you poke the bear, you say all this stuff, and then your head coach comes out after you get smacked and calls you soft. Soft is it, bad. It's, it, 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 it wasn't smart. I th hopefully he'll learn from this and realize that this is not how you handle business and this is not what you do like in this industry of the NBA. I love the I love the social media outlets now where everybody has a voice and the shit talking can continue off the court. But 
again, this was, they were going to a, a gunfight with a pocket knife and they had no chance. They're not a better team than the Warriors. I don't care the ups and downs, whatever. They had a tall mountain to climb. So this wasn't even a, a, the right fight to pick if you're Atari Eason, but uh, the stamp afterwards of uh, Yudoka calling him soft and scared just makes it that much worse. Um, full disclosure, I just need to say, we just had an earthquake here in New York City. <laughs> Either that or the subway underneath the ground just came out of the ground and bumped the entire But, but I just want to say I'm, I'm a little bit freaked out. I didn't know you could have earthquakes in New York. <laughs> so if anybody could look into that and send me some research, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, the, the I hope whole you're okay, Michelle. Are you good? No, no, I'm fine. But I, I, it was during the Ime Odoka sound and I just sat there and the whole thing was going like this. And I didn't know you could do that here. I'm used to it in California. <laughs> so it's a little oh. bit weird. Um, but the, so the rocket season all but being over, right, Choms? Um, and I think in the end, what they did sort of as the season progressed is, is a positive note and something to build on. Do you think they're planning on making any moves, any bigger moves, or are they going to stick with what they have and build? In, in the grand scheme of this, this is a positive outcome for the Rockets, for them to be fighting for a playing spot. This is a team that won, I think, 22 games a season ago. Now they're at 38, already a 16-win increase. You have to give Ime Yudoka a lot of credit. Rafael Stone, their general manager, I mean, they've stockpiled a ton of young players, guys that you can build around moving forward. They've got a boatload of draft picks from the James Harden trade uh, a couple years ago. Um, so this is a team that's that's obviously got a lot of upside. If They're definitely going to be in the market. If there's a superstar player that becomes available, they'll have the necessary talent. They'll have the draft picks to do so. We've discussed it. They've made a call, made an inquiry on Mikhail Bridges, discussed some concepts with, with the Nets about him. Uh, you know, that deal did not happen, obviously. So when you think about going into the summer now, Jalen Green, Alper, and Singoon, both extension-eligible players, both clearly are putting themselves in a position where if it's not a max contract, it might be close to a max but the thing is, is Jalen Green's production without Alper and Sengun, he's averaging almost 30 points a night, almost eight rebounds, five assists. With Sengun in the lineup, 18 points, five rebounds, three assists. They play faster. They play a little bit more versatile. Jabari Smith playing the five when Sengun is out. This is a team that has a lot more speed and, 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 and kind of pace to their game without Sengun. So, you know, what route do you go? Do you go the route of deciding between the two players? Do you go the route of incorporating Sengun back in next season and just seeing how this team does, playing a little bit more fast, playing a little bit more up-tempo, the way Ime Yudoka wants to, and having Sengun kind of adjust. There's a lot of options. I'm curious, Chandler's perspective on how you Same. approach this to be the general manager, knowing this team ha has had a ton of success without Sengun in the lineup the last few weeks. Yeah, guys, when you have a season like the Rockets had in their exit meetings, they're going to focus on that run, that stretch, that that 10, 11 game win streak that they succeeded. And what did they do differently when they did that? They played faster and they played through Jalen Green. So I think as a, you know, as Raphael Stone, as Udoka moving forward, I think you realize that Singoon is your best player, right? You're paying and you're probably paying both of these guys just because they are both extremely talented. And I think find a way to make it work. But on the other hand, you really realize how good Jalen Green can be. So, yes, we can look at these numbers that he's this much worse with Sangoon. He's this much better without him. But when you look at these, both these guys are super young. They have a chance to be an extremely good duo in this league for many, many years to come. They just have to adjust. They have to watch a lot of film. They have to get in the gym together. They have to develop that chemistry and realize that there's got to be a balance, right? There's got to be a balance of putting the ball in Jalen's hands and playing faster and Sangoon running and picking and popping a little more. And then the next position possession sure when it gets slowed down all right let's play through the big fella like Jokic and the Nuggets do and kind of have that balanced attack where we know we have this inside out duo that can do it you know multiple different ways and any given night it could be Jalen's night and then it could be Sangoon's night and then by the way they have young assets too like Cam Whitmore like Jabari Smith like Thompson so they're in a really good spot they mixed in some solid vets here and and they've showed flashes of brilliance this season so I I don't think that this is a deflating season. I don't think that, you know, there's a fire drill going in Houston where they're going to unload a lot of things. I think they have the right pieces going forward. They have to figure out a way for Sangoon and Green to, to coexist. But they're in a pretty good spot, and they've shown that they can compete. And now with a year older, a year better, adding some more pieces, I think the Rockets will be right there and, and, and you know, in the playoff hunt next season. So I think come exit meeting time, they're going to look at this season – as a success, the new coach, a lot of new roles, new opportunities. And next year, I think the expectations will, will be a lot higher.
Yeah, I think it was a hell of a success. It's an interesting problem to have. You have two great players, and now you got to figure out how to make it work. But we're going to take a quick break so we can all powder our noses. And uh, when we come back with some more Run It Back, Shams, you ain't going nowhere. We'll be back. Run it back. Run it all. All right, we're back with some Clippers Nuggets game. This is another. By the way, I Jet Blue, thank you for allowing us to watch live games. We're all in there. But the uh, the Clippers and Nuggets. This was a big one, and I can't even find it. Here we go. <laughs> Clippers holding off Jokic, and it was a close one. I will say that uh, they split the season series two two. It's it's another addition to the what exactly is this Clippers team story that we're trying to figure out. Again, no Jamal, Jamal Murray on the Denver side of things, but Paul George twenty eight and four, Harden twenty eight and six. 22-0. Uh, Jokic, of course, 36, 17 to 10. You just assume that there's a triple double in there somewhere. But right now, the Clippers are seven and five over their last 12. And like I just mentioned, Chandler, it's sort of one of those mysteries we can't quite figure out and put our finger on who they are. Who are they? Because we are in the <laughs> final stretch. <laughs> well, if we're gonna if we're gonna say there's no Jamal Murray, we gotta say there's no Kawhi Leonard because he's more That's fair. more important to the Clippers than Jamal Murray is to the Nuggets. But listen, this is a team with high expectations. Once they made the big move and they, and they got Russ back and. Uh, this is a team that is deep. This is a team that's built to win right now. And this is a team that is extremely, extremely dangerous. They've just, over the last couple weeks, months, have showed us a lot of inconsistencies. And to me, it's James Harden. To me, I, I would love to see him be more aggressive, especially nights like this when Kawhi Leonard is out. I want, and last night he, he actually, he was, he took 23 shots. But when I see him have these, these low, you know, field goal attempt games, when I see him have nine to 15 points, that's not what he does. He's one of the best scorers of all time. He has the best ISO handle. He can get to any shot he wants and he can get to the foul line. <laughs> A lot. He's the he, remember. He's the guy that changed the rules on the fouls on the on the pull throughs. He, he's the guy that can do that. So when you look at this team and and, and a guy like Kawhi, who's so valuable, his team is out. I want James Harden to continue to be aggressive. I want him to take more shots. I want him to dominate games like he did in Houston. And all he needs left on his resume is a championship. And this is a team where he's got championship aspirations. So. In my eyes, it's gonna he's gonna be important because it, uh, these guys are gonna miss some times. They're gonna miss some games. Hopefully, they're at full strength and at full strength they are uh, at a whole nother level. But to me, I want to see James Harden get back to his ways of, of being aggressive, being dominant, taking over games late, getting to the foul line, and doing what he does. Because Paul George, for the most part, is pretty consistent. Kawhi Leonard's very consistent when he's healthy. To me, their bench is great. Zubak's been solid. Man, Powell, Westbrook, those guys are going to do what they do. They're going to throw in 8 to 12 points. They're going to play defense. They're going to give energy. James Harden, to me, is the, is the key. He's got to be aggressive. He has the ball in his hands all a lot of the time. Be aggressive yeah. and go do what you do. Can I ask a probably silly question, but it's something I've always wondered about James Harden because you know he's got, obviously, a reputation of some of these postseason games where he just disappears what happens when a player that is obviously great and can take over a game when he needs to also can just as easily disappear? Like, what is the thing that triggers that from game to game? Well, he's also had some really big playoff games, too. So I, I don't sure, think No, it's exactly. So I, I, it's just inconsistent. I think it just goes in ways. Also, when he was, especially in Houston, when he was the main guy, like when I play with them, everybody's defensive scheme, everything's set up to to stop him. So he's he is the head of the snake most nights because his usage rate, he has the ball. So he's seen every defense. He's seen guys trying to make him get to his right hand because everybody knows he likes to go left. He's seen double teams. He's seen blitzes. He's seen, you know, damn near box and one. So he's seen every defense. I think it's hard sometimes on the fly to adjust like that. When you're a guy as dominating as he has been in the past, it's hard for him to give up the ball too and let a Paul George go rock, let a Kawhi Leonard go rock. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the team that he's, you know, he's got two other monsters that can kind of, you know, offset some of that load on the offensive end and their bench too. Like Norman Powell is, an, is a scorer. There's going to be times where he's going to take over a game. So that's the luxury this team has. But I think James Harden is too talented to, to continue to struggle like this. And I think it all just comes down to him being aggressive and just finding that rhythm and that balance within this offense. 
Um, if you blinked last night or maybe ran to the restroom at some point and you came back and you were like, where's Mike Malone? Well, he got ejected. Uh, <laughs> he was fired up and Harden. Harden's just there. I kind of love the just being there, kind of instigating. <laughs> <laughs> mocking and as the ref kicks him out. Uh, I feel like Chandler asking you this is just a setup for a duh, but have you been um, the annoying instigator in any of these moments? And by, and I use the word annoying lovingly here because it's funny. I don't want to say no, because I feel like if I do, you're <laughs> going to have like a clip of me in the background, give them the old heave ho, but uh, maybe, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, do, I do find it really, really funny when players do this because I feel like most of the time when, when coaches and players, when they do this, they're doing it on purpose. They're sending a, they're setting a fire under their team that they, they know you can't just go mother F a ref and you can't just continue. <laughs> say stop. Like you, you're, you're supposed to stop. If you don't, you know, you're going to get tossed. And so I've done situations like this before where I've been on that end where like I've, you know, I knew if I said one more thing to, you know, Joey Crawford, <laughs> he's going to team me up. So you, you, you know that going in and sometimes sure you can't control your emotions and you get like this and maybe it just happened. But for the most part, when coaches do this, it's to send a message. It's to get the guys going. It's the, okay, this is, this is the last hell Mary. I'm going to get tossed and hopefully spark this team uh, to finish strong here. But I don't know that I've ever, I don't even want to say, I probably <laughs> I don't know the you answer. Probably have. I probably have. He did it perfectly. It was well done on both parts, Malone and Harden. We had to take a quick break right now. Shams, it's Friday night. Can I expect you to uh, to rage? We we'll be turning up. I'm flying yeah. to LA. I'm going to Chandler's. Yeah, we're turning up. You're going to Chandler's? I didn't get this. Damn right. Yeah, yeah, that's You're exactly right. All right, Michael Bowling on the back in side. My, of in my mind, in my we'll imagination. Right oh, earthquake. <laughs> Oh, he's back just in time. Michael Bowling, BR betting just in time because I'm back in New York, Michael. So I can actually place the bets that you tell me to place today. And that makes let's me go. very, very, very happy. All right, let's go. Warriors at the Mavs. Man, these are getting good as we go on. Back to back with Warriors winning by four this past Tuesday. Uh, that was in Dallas. The odds right now are what? Uh, Mavericks minus five and a half over under 226. Where is you? I like the Mavericks tonight. Um, I think it's like quietly as it's kept, man. It, it, you see a team with Luka who probably should get more recognition for MVP. They've won nine. They've won a ton of games lately and they're playing <laughs> their best basketball right now. So I'm leaning uh, Mavericks minus five and a half. I think the Warriors put way too much into this Rockets thing last night. I heard you guys talking about it earlier. So they're the back to back. I think this is going to be a Mavericks win. And I would lean the under. It was 228 this morning, now 226. So that's a good sign. Mm. So like Dallas tonight. Chandler, yeah, we, that's I'm, a good point with the Warriors, huh? They might be. Spent. I'm with Michael. I think last night. It was kind of their statement game. Like, all right, let, let's knock off these dudes. And now it's a back-to-back. -back. Once we got that, they're cozy in that 10 spot. Now I think it's, okay, how do we get fully healthy to prepare for this play-in game against the Lakers? They don't care about this game tonight against the Mavs. I love the Mavs minus five and a half tonight. I can right, see I'm some moving. of the Warriors even sitting out after, like, Clay Thompson, big game. Like, you know what I mean? I could see the Mavs are going to be all over them tonight. Can't, uh, Kelly yeah, Thompson is... can't sit out. We need him to play every single game. All of them. <laughs> Have I mentioned that all of the games matter as we head down this final stretch? Because this next one up, Timberwolves at Suns. This is another battle of the beast at this point. They've won eight of their last 10, Minnesota has. And we know that the Suns are on a bit of a tear as they fight to stay out of that play in. Uh, Suns minus four over under 217, Michael. You agree? Uh, I'm taking the T-Wolves tonight. I think the Suns are playing well, but at the same time, the T-Wolves have won nine of their last 11. So they're <laughs> playing just as good basketball. This is without Cat. I think Anthony Edwards understands now he's got to put the bulk of the scoring on his back. But one guy I think you need to watch, Naz Reed. He is an absolute freak. And obviously the Suns lack a little big <laughs> inside Nurkic game time decision. I'm going with the T-Wolves in a close one. I'll take the four points. And I'm leaning over here. This might be a track meet. So uh, give me the T-Wolves, give me the over. And I love, love Minnesota tonight. Yeah, I like the over. I like the over for sure. Neither team played last night. I think there'll be a lot of buckets in this game. The thing is, to me, it's funny that we're talking about the number one ranked Minnesota Timberwolves against 
right now the eighth Phoenix Suns, and they're favored by four points. And I know Towns out, and I know there's been some injuries, but that just shows you the fear and the respect that the Phoenix Suns and that resume with Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, Kevin Durant have over the non-proven Minnesota Timberwolves. So I'm going the other way. I think I wish I could take money line. I guess we're not doing that here. The four points is a little steep. But I would, I'm going to go Phoenix minus Shake four. It. I think they are playing for something. I think they want to continue to rise. New Orleans is right there to catch tonight to avoid this play. And so every game, I think, is more important for the Suns than the Timberwolves. I got I got Phoenix tonight. Obsessed with this final stretch. Obsessed. All right, we're going to start doing the uh, the old BR betting, run it back, same game parlay. How could we fail, Michael? Uh, you get the first <laughs> two picks. Go ahead. All right, so I'll start this thing off with Kevin Durant. I'm going to have him to make two threes tonight. He's actually hit three in five straight. So oh, going to take it easy. Want to make sure we see one go through the hoop. And then on the other side, I'm going to take Mike Conley to have six assists. This is cashed in six straight. I think he's another X factor in this game. He really gets these guys organized. And I really do believe that if they are going to be the winner tonight, which obviously I think they're going to cover the four, he's going to have a bunch of dimes. So I'm going KD, two threes, Mike Conley, six assists. And I'm curious, what do you guys got? I mean, I'm scared because Chandler speaks for all of us. So here we go. Yeah. No, I like I like both of those. And I went with the two shooting guards, like Devin Booker and Anthony Edwards. I think they're both trying to prove, okay, I'm the best shooting guard in the NBA. Now I'm the best shooting guard in the NBA. So I got Devin Booker over two and a half threes. I think he's going to shoot a lot of them. I think he's going to get a lot of open looks with the way that the Suns play offense, the way people guard Kevin Durant. So I love him. And then on the other hand, I like Anthony Edwards with a statement game tonight. He's going against arguably the best shooting guard, one of the best two guards in the league. I think he is going to go over 27 and a half. I think he's going to have a big game. It's just not going to be enough to get the dub. I like this one. All right, plus 514. I like this one a lot. We got some And by the way, we well. think oh, we no. think before we even knew these picks, Michael, we both had the over in this game. So it's good that it's good that the props yeah, are Yeah, we need a lot of buckets. <laughs> we need a lot of buckets. A lot of buckets, a lot of threes. We got this. How could it not be? I, I it's, it's got to be a thing. It's got to be a lot of points. Prop parties up next. Um you have three good ones for us, Michael? I got three good I ones. Props. Uh First, I'll start. If anyone remembers the Charlotte Hornets are still playing basketball, I'm taking Miles oh. Bridges over two and a half assists. He's cashed this in eight of his last 10. You may not think he's a big assist guy, but we only need three of them. Love this play. Mm -hmm. uh, hometown Bulls, DeMar DeRozan over three and a half rebounds tonight. The Knicks are lacking size. Obviously played a black back to back last night. This is cashed in six of 10. Give me Debo. And then in the late game, you got to stay up late. Colin Sexton <laughs> over eight and a half rebounds plus assists. He's got so much energy. The clips are probably spent after last night's game with the Nuggets. This is cash in seven of 10. So these are my picks. Love them tonight. Parlay them. Got three to one. Yes. Have some fun. It's the only way to go, Chandler's to parlay. And the future, I this is... I love this part when we take some of these future ones. We got the playoffs right around the corner. It's never too early to start looking ahead to see if we can make some cash, Michael. Talk to me. All right, some big numbers here. I really like the Sixers. To win the East, plus 950 right now was plus 1,000 yesterday, so the books Whoa. are in agreement. They're going to avoid the Celtics. They're playing really good basketball. They've got Joel Embiid back. It looks like he hasn't even missed any time. I think he had 29 last night. They're a tough matchup for the Bucks. I watched this uh, on opening night against Milwaukee. So I'll take the Sixers to win the East. And on the other side, I mentioned them earlier, the Mavericks, plus 1,200 to win the West. They avoid the Nuggets. And I think anytime you have Luka versus like the Clippers, potentially, mm. you're gonna have a shot in that series. Don't sleep on how big Kyrie can be in the playoffs. Obviously, you guys know that. So Sixers win the East, Mavs win the West. That'd be a fun finals, wouldn't you think? That That'd be crazy I love, huge. I I love the Mavs plus 12 and a half. I think as as deep as the Western Conference is, the Celtics are going to win the East. You know what I mean? So that, that's tough for me. I, if I had to pick the Celtics or the field, I, I probably am taking the Celtics. The Mavs, I think, with that duo, with the way Kyrie Irving is playing, with the addition of Gafford and P.J. Washington, I think I, I love those odds, plus 12 and a half, especially if they can avoid the Nuggets till the Western Conference Finals. I'm all over that one. I gotta be honest, I keep taking the field on the Boston thing, Michael. I think Chandler just, he keeps telling me Boston or the field, he takes Boston. 
I'm I'm not a big believer in the Celtics, even though their record is what they're what it is. Um, I guess the metrics obviously agree as well. I just think we got to see Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown be clutch, and I haven't seen yeah. it yet. Not in the playoffs. If they run into Miami, you guys mentioned it earlier. We could mm-hmm. be uh, it could be a little house of horrors. So like I'm not necessarily on the field yet. Yeah, I'm 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 field. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna take a quick break, Michael. We. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be able to put some of these bets in. And uh, we'll take a quick break here and come right back in a minute. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. You buying that time for, uh, well, it's just you, Chandler. So it's either you buy it or you don't. That's how this is going to be played out. Uh, But his recent podcast, Draymond does a lot of podcasts, but he did say something brilliant. He said, Victor Wembenyama, oh, I'm turning into everybody else, should be defensive player of the year. Are you buying that? No, I'm not. And the only <laughs> and the only reason is, by the way, he's going to finish second. And he could very oh, well win this game with the block shots, with the rebounds, with the crazy stats and numbers that he puts up. But you can convince me, fine, rookie of the year, winning doesn't matter. But defensive player of the year, the Minnesota Timberwolves would not be the one seed right now without Rudy Gobert doing what he does on the defensive end, altering shots, playing defense, doing everything he does for that team. So fine, rookie of the year, they get drafted to a shit team, you put up great stats, win it. But defensive player of the year, that carries more weight of winning and your team succeeding and playing when it matters in June. And the Timberwolves have a chance to do that. San Antonio Spurs don't, but Wimby will be a close second, but it's it's Gobert's. And he's got many, many years. As he himself said, Gobert can have it, but after today, after this year, it's open. Uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich and his coach, Quinn Snyder, got into a heated exchange on the sidelines Wednesday. Um, but after the game, uh, Bogdan said, that means we both care. <gasps> you buying that, Chandler? Ooh, ooh. Um, I am buying it, but there's also, listen, every player and coach has a relationship, right? Whether that's good, whether that's not so good, whether that's personal or not. Good coaches have a relationship with you where they know they can jump your ass, they can go off on you, they can they can rip you and film, but they know it's love and respect. And after that, you go and you get lunch or you go watch a game <laughs> and it's all fine. I don't know the dynamic of these two, but like, like if JB Bickerstaff and me did this, no problem. We would text about it later. We would have if Lloyd Pierce did this to me, it would be personal <laughs> and I wouldn't like it at all. So like there's a different dynamic, but I do like the fire and I do like where their season is and where they are. I like that they still care, but also that could also be the other way where it's just frustration and they're miserable. Well, the the big reveal is they dapped it up afterwards, so seems like it's all good. Exactly. If Lloyd Pierce did it to you, would you put a bunch of dog crap in a paper bag and throw it at his door? <laughs> oh, I'm just saying there's different relationships where I didn't have that relationship with him where I feel like he could go at me like that and he probably felt the same way about me. So it's a different dynamic. JB could mother F me and talk <laughs> shit about my mother and I wouldn't care. That's perfect. All right, that's going to do it for us. Enjoy the weekend. Stay safe. Run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Yeah.